Good morning. I'm uh, Harris Simmons. I'm uh, chair of the Utah Board of Regents. And it's my honor to welcome all of you to the University of Utah and to President Watkins' inauguration symposium on public universities and America's uh, future. Today, we are fortunate to convene this group of thought leaders in the new and, and beautiful Gardner's, uh, Gardner Commons building to have a rich dialogue about the future of higher education. We're fortunate to have many esteemed higher education leaders, friends of the University of Utah from across the country, who are uh, in attendance with us today. And the Board of Regents joins me in welcoming you warmly to Utah and to the University of Utah on this beautiful fall day. Today, we will hear how the University of Utah and other higher education leaders are analyzing and reimagining the uh, role of public universities as we enter uh, a new era. I look forward to a uh, day of wonderful discussion about both the challenges and the opportunities that face public universities, which are such a marvelous invention. Uh, that really enrich our society. The University of Utah has an incredibly rich tradition as both the state's flagship institution and as one of the oldest public universities in the United States. The future of the University of Utah has never been brighter. And we are excited to see President Watkins lead this institution to even greater heights. President Watkins takes the helm at a critical time of growth and new leadership for the university. Her commitment to this institution and her deep knowledge of the students, the faculty, the staff, the issues that are facing higher education make her the perfect leader to usher in this new period. So if you'll please join me in welcoming President Watkins to introduce today's symposium. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really honored that so many people uh, found the time to join this conversation today. And it's just a pleasure to look around uh, the, the room and see so many leaders in higher education, and particularly in public higher education, people who are making a difference every day in their work. I'm particularly grateful to leaders from our state, our trustees, our regents who are with us today, from uh, others who are involved in our community and in strengthening this great institution, and to my colleagues from the University of Utah, special thanks for making time to be part of this dialogue. I think the work is quite important. The stakes really could not be higher. The future of public universities matters a great deal to America. We think about the volume uh, of work in terms of education that happens in public universities. We think about the innovation in both discovery and generation of knowledge and in education. And we think about the role that public universities play in strengthening their communities, their states, and their regions. Uh, this work is vital to our success, and I love the fact that we have a day to focus on both what we are doing now and the goal of generating ideas for how we can ensure vibrancy for public universities for generations to come. I'm honored that you would take the time to be part of this dialogue, and my big hope for today is that we leave with, uh, where's Pam Perlick? We were just talking about this. Pam challenged me to a dozen great ideas coming out of this day. <laughs> so Pam put it out there. I said. I said, I hope uh, we get a good idea or two out of today for the future. Pam said, oh no, Ruth, no. We need at least a dozen really great ideas. And I think that's a good goal for us, to imagine um, how the actions we take today can ensure vibrancy of this great American institution for generations to come. I know that part of this discussion today, we're gonna to hear different models from different institutions, and I'm particularly grateful to my colleagues from around the country who have joined this conversation. We're also gonna hear a little bit about the University of Utah, and I think you will hear uh, what Chair Simmons uh, just said, that the University of Utah has been on a remarkable upward trajectory, and we are delighted to be able to tell you that. I also think it's important that we are acknowledging we still have work to do, and that work is important, and this is a day where we get to imagine that. So we have our challenge, a dozen great ideas for public universities going forward, 
and thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Rich Kendall. I saw him a moment ago, but I've lost him now. Where did he go? Oh, good job, Rich. Right in front of me, right here. So elusive, Rich. Uh, Rich has been a leader in higher education in the state of Utah for many, many years. Uh, he served as the commissioner of our Utah system of higher education, and he is now using all of his talents and um, skills, abilities, and relationships to help advance the conversation of how we fund education, both K-12 and higher education, to ensure vibrancy for many years in the future. I'm very grateful that Rich is with us today, and we'll turn to him. Thank you. What a pleasure to be here. Uh, to let you know how long I've been around, I said to Harris Simmons, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to work with you. He's chairman of the Board of Regents. But I did work with his father, Roy Simmons, who was on the very first Board of Regents. <laughs> that was back in the 60s. Congratulations, uh, President Watkins. Uh, you will be a wonderful leader for this institution, and you'll join the ranks of many really distinguished people that have helped this institution become what it is. I also want to say, Mr. Simmons, to the regents, the trustees, and the university community did a wonderful and rigorous job of selecting this president. Uh, the topic for this first session is the university's role in exceptional education and workforce in the 21st century. I will just take a minute to note that 35 years ago, a president of this university David Gardner chaired a national commission on the quality of education. It was called A Nation at Risk. He warned us that if we didn't do better and reform the quality of education, much of it focused on public education, that we were going to fall badly behind. So I'm going to sh now shift forward to 2017. This is a report from the uh, National Council of State Legislators. And uh, they took 18 months preparing a report, and I'm going to give you one paragraph. The bad news is that most state education systems are falling dangerously behind the world in a number of international comparisons and on our own national assessment of educational progress. Leaving the United States overwhelmingly unprepared to succeed in the 21st century. The U.S. workforce, widely acknowledged to be the best educated in the world, half a century ago, is now among the least well-educated in the world, according to recent studies. At this pace, we will struggle to compete economically against even developing nations, and our children will struggle to find jobs in the global economy. It's a pretty harsh statement. It's a wonderful report. Well done. Uh, and if it's not accurate, at least it's provocative. Um, so, major challenges lie ahead for K through 12, and major challenges lie ahead for higher education. And uh, I'm pleased to be part of this forum this morning. I'm also happy to uh, introduce Pam Perlick. Um, she's a friend, a colleague, and an ally in many projects. And many times when I found myself in a tight spot, I had the same idea, call Pam. She will help because her her reports and her data are always accurate, always thorough, and always fair-minded. Pam, you're up. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. Thank you. We are witnessing and participating in a great economic, demographic, and cultural transformation. The roots of these transformations are found in our increasing interconnectedness and interdependencies as we're relating to the global economy and technology as it pervades the planet. Well, demographically, we're shifting too because each of us individually and within the institutional constraints and contexts of our communities are responding to these di and other dynamics. And as we do, we are collectively reshaping the demographics of our communities, our nation, and our planet. 
So the drivers of, of the demographic transformation that we're looking at today are really found in three forces. And one is the coming of immigrants in large numbers and in very identifiable epochs in the past and well into the future. Secondly, the aging of the population, uh, partly because of increasing life expectancies, we're all living longer, but also because of this enormous post-World War II baby boom generation, right now we are dragging up the median age. And thirdly, it's the differential fertility rates that we see and the trends in these differential fertility rates that we see in different populations, whether they're native born, whether we're immigrant, or whether we're ethnic enclaves, including the ethnic enclave of Mormons here in Utah. Well, luckily, demographers are able to measure and identify these long-run demographic trends and build models to look at the possibilities and implications of these trends into the future. Here we're looking at annual growth rates for all of the decades going back into the 20th century and then projections beyond. Here in Utah, the Kem Gardner Policy Institute, we do these projections for Utah. And the nation, it's the, it's the Census Bureau. And what you can see is that projected population growth rates remain positive for our nation, and that here in Utah, they remain about double the rate that they are nationally. Then there are education policy analysts who compare these demographic projections with projections of participation rates and completion rates in high school. And from that, they've seen that we have a plateau in the expected number of high school graduates in traditional ages, and then a decline into the future. And again, part of this is the participation rates that are observed today and the completion rates in different subpopulations, which we can change. They've translated that research into state-level results. And here you can see in blue the states that are expected to have declining high school graduation, number of population. In white, the states that are about flat. And in orange and yellow, the states where we expect the number of high school graduates to increase, but not at the rates that we've seen or the amounts that we've seen in the past. This is all largely driven by the births in our nation and in our state. The top line shows you uh, births in our nation from 1940 into the most recent year of data. And you can see that great wave of post-World War II baby boomers beginning in 46 and ending in 64. And then their children in the echo boom in about the early 1990s, you'll note that those births were not as high as the post-World War II baby booms. And so demographers, humans, of course, were marvelously extrapolative in our thinking. Uh, we think about 30 years out, we would have seen another boom that would have been smaller than the 1990s. But surprise, we had another peak that actually eclipsed the post-World War II baby boom in 2008 nationally, uh, 2007 nationally, and 2008 in Utah. And this is largely attributable to the coming of immigrants in large numbers and their relatively high fertility rates. And by the way, people move when they're young, and people have babies when they're young, too. And so you'll note that even as we've come out of the Great Recession, births continue to decline. And here in Utah, often called the birth capital of the nation, our births have been on now what looks to be a 10-year decline, actual numbers of births going down. And when that's the case, we can see how that translates into, see our pattern's a little different down there on the red line in Utah. Uh, we were in a, kind of a baby boom situation forever and really peaked in the early 80s, declined a bit, and then peaked in 2008 and have declined since. Preliminary data that just come to our research team makes it, it seem like we're going to see more birth declines in 2018. That's a 10-year run of declines in the number of children born here in Utah and nationally. And that will obviously uh, play itself out in the number of high school graduates, the number of college-age students, and the number of school-age students. Here are estimates and projections of school age and college age population in Utah. And while the, the line is generally upward, a 10 year run of declines in birth are going to be expressed in declines in those populations. And so there you see the school age population uh, begins to, the, the rate of increase decelerates and then increases. We actually show births, we project that they'll come back. 
But here in the college age populations, as that wave of uh, declines in births go through, then you can see that we have a slow rate of increase in college age population and then ultimately a decline, even here in Utah. Now, when we look at the most recent population trends, we can see that the Intermountain states are among the most rapidly growing states in the most recent estimates. Those states in yellow are actually declining, either through deaths exceeding births or from, from more people moving out than moving in. So we're in a region of growth. Now, this one's a complicated one, so hang with me. This one is showing you the contribution of minorities to population growth. Um, for all of the states that are in orange or yellow, that's showing you the percentage of population growth since the last decennial census that is because of the growth in minority populations. So here in Utah, over that period of time, about four in 10 new Utahns are minorities either through in-migration or births greater than deaths. You, then you can see that for some states like Oklahoma, it's nearly 100% of all population growth. Um, and then the red states, the red states are states where you've had a decline in the white, not Hispanic population, but increases in minority populations. So to the extent that those places experience any population growth at all, it's because of the growth in the multicultural, multilingual, multi-ethnic populations. And this increasingly will become the story of our nation. If we look at the most recent uh, data that we have, you can see how that proportion is increasing for Utah, 41% of population growth attributable to the growth in the minority population, and nationally, 97%. If we didn't have people who had come in large numbers at the, at, uh, for migrants from international source regions and that they sit, came and had families here, we would have a much older, a much smaller, and a much less diverse population. And into the future then, this becomes more and more the case. This accumulates and gains momentum and so that we become the multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual nation that we are already in process of becoming. What does that mean for our youth? Well, right now, white, not Hispanic folks are just roughly a little over half of all youth. By 2060, then you can see that they become part of this much more diverse tapestry that is the multicultural, multi-ethnic, mixed heritage. Kids are the fastest growing population that we have, and that's where we're headed. Uh, in the past, those red bars show you that most of Utah's population growth was internally generated through natural increase. But as you can see on those top bars, as we move into the more modern period and into the future, net in-migration becomes a greater and greater driver of our population growth here in the state. And that being the case, people bring their characteristics from the outside world, and we change as a result. And of course, the people who move here, I being one, have been changed by the experience of being part of this place. We create, co-create the future together. What does that look like for the nation? Well, these are window years, but you can see the increasing contribution of international migration to our, na to our nation's growth, where natural increase is a smaller and smaller share. Natural increase is births greater than deaths. Here we see the history of migration, international migration to Utah. And to the left, you can see that immigrants did settle the West. They didn't come in large numbers in the middle of the 20th century, but then migration begins to accelerate again. Again, it is co uh, connected to the globalization of the economy and the growth of Utah. You see a similar pattern, U-shaped pattern nationally, and now look into the projections. And so that over time, migration to the US becomes an ever more important driver of population growth and also population change. But where would people be coming from? And as you can see, these are the trends that we're seeing in current data as well. The main sending region being Asia, followed by Mexico, Latin America, and you can see the rest. This is a truly global flow of migrants coming to Utah and to our nation. 
Uh, and if we look in the most recent data for Utah, that top bar shows you that prior to the, great, the onset of the Great Recession, the main sending region to Utah was Latin America, but now the main sending region is Asia. So those patterns we expect uh, to continue into the future. This is the composition of Utah's foreign-born population, and you can see how it's shifting more and more towards Asian, although dominated by Latin America currently. So how are these long-term trends playing out nationally and in Utah? Well, we have among the highest fertility rates in the nation, but for the first time in the years that I've studied fertility, Utah's no longer number one. We're, it's now South Dakota. Uh, and <laughs> That's a big deal. <laughs> and you can see that family sizes and household sizes have come down dramatically. Replacement fertility is, is 2.1, and so this is a, a dramatic decline. Uh, and just the household sizes in Utah, still the largest in the nation, but declining. Um, in the median age, we're the youngest state in the nation, but now half of our population is over 31 years old. And I remember growing up and thinking to never trust anyone <laughs> over 30. <laughs> uh, well, that's now half of the people in our nation. Uh, so we're moving in the same direction as the nation, but we maintain a, relatively, uh, a relative differential, uh, of course, because of the, big, of the dominance of the Mormon culture region and its imprint in the culture and the demographics of our state and region. Minorities as a share of the population, as we have seen, are increasing, although we're lower level than the nation. Uh, the female age at first marriage, we know people are marrying less, and they're marrying older, and they're having fewer children. And this is most pronounced among the white native-born populations in our nation. Um, and the iconic Utah household, which is the share of married couple, opposite sex married couple families with children, which are now 30% of households in Utah and one in five nationally. So this is the stereotype, which is a minority. So we've got a diversity along so many different measures. Uh, and we look at the age distribution and the, the summary of it, again, I will uh, beg your indulgence here, but the bottom square shows you the number of youth and the top square shows you the number of elders, 65 and older, and then 18 and younger, per 100 working age people. Back here in 1970, the baby boomers puffed up that red square. Then we became part of the workforce, and now as we're aging, we're hopping up in that gray square. And so by the year 2030, 65 and older are one in five people in the nation. That's pretty amazing. And then from there on out, elders, outnumber youth. That happens a little sooner in the, nation, in the nation than it does in Utah, but it will happen here too. And while we maintain a larger share of youth, elders grow in large proportions. And we end up at that one in five elders as part of the population just about a generation later. So this shows you the age distribution of minorities, beginning at preschool age on the left and working up to be top coded at 85 and older on the right. And what it shows you is that youth, the preschoolers in the state, one in four are minority, one in three in Salt Lake County, half nationally, half in Salt Lake City, and three quarters on the west side of Salt Lake City. So what we have not addressed, and we've looked at everything at a state level, is that all these trends are, are really expressing themselves in many, many diverse ways across communities. And that has high, a high level of impact on people's access to opportunity and resources. And we see that at a community level, life expectancy can vary dramatically from one neighborhood to the next. So while we're all impacted by the big trends, we have to remember that our access to opportunities and how these trends uh, play out in our neighborhoods are very different and also um, by generation. So what the story is, what the big story is, people, is that for many years we were dominated by people of European origins, although let's not forget, until 1920 we never really, uh, never really did a serious enumeration of Native Americans. But the old white baby boomers are dying off, being replaced by the multicultural, multilingual, multi-ethnic heritage people. So every year that we do a survey in our schools and ask the kids, 
What language do you speak when you go home at night? And here in Utah, in the most recent survey that I know, they reported 129 languages. So what I'm here to tell you today is that we have challenges. Uh, that these challenges play out in the opportunities that people either have or are blocked from in our neighborhoods, but that we really live at a time of incredible abundance. We've never had greater technological capability. We are incredibly capable. We are incredibly affluent. And so what really we are called to do as a community is to re-engineer those infrastructures of opportunity so they work for a new day. These changes, they're ongoing, they're cumulative, and they are irreversible. Ongoing and irreversible, and have enormous impact for our communities and for the possibilities of the next generation. A new day is dawning. Thank you. It is now my great pleasure to introduce President Emerita Terry Sullivan. As president of the University of Virginia, she led a team, a very successful team, that stimulated the revitalization of their health system, that raised faculty salaries, launched an ambitious program of faculty hiring, increased both the number and the quality of the students they were getting, and reached new fundraising records. Clearly, she was a very successful president, and we're thrilled to have her with us today. Prior to becoming president, Terry served as the executive vice president and provost of the University of Michigan, the executive vice chancellor for academic affairs for the whole University of Texas system, and vice president and dean of the graduate school at the University of Texas at Austin. She is an award-winning author and a fellow of both the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Teresa graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Michigan State University and holds a PhD from the University of Chicago. Terry, we welcome you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much and good morning, everybody. What a beautiful day in Salt Lake. Let me first begin by offering uh, my heartfelt congratulations to President Watkins. She's leading a university that has made great strides recently and is poised to do even more under her leadership. I also welcome her to the confraternity of university presidents, a supportive group who understand the challenges and delights of the job. And I'm deeply honored on behalf of myself and the University of Virginia to participate today and to bring our greetings and felicitations. You've probably heard that the two happiest days in a boat owner's life are the day he buys the boat and the day he sells it. So let me just say that Ruth is about to experience one of the happiest days of her life. <laughs> Universities play an increasingly important role in the life of our republic. That's true because our economy and our society have become more complex and more diverse. Wasn't the preceding demonstration a great example of that? And to function in effectively today in this complex economy and society requires more than a 12th grade competency. It's also the case that the great productivity of America makes it possible for us to spare our young people from the workforce for four to five years. And research universities are part of the great engine that keeps that productivity humming, in part because research universities give birth every year to the patents, technologies, firms, and even whole new industries and the University of Utah is an active and growing part of that engine. So today I want to talk about one function of the university, which is its interface with the labor market of the future. A future that is not yet formed, 
and whose contours we still glimpse, but not completely. You just saw, for example, a great, exa uh, a, a great demonstration of the ways in which Utah is likely to change in the future. But there are also efforts in Washington to change dramatically the volume and the composition of that immigration stream, which could mean that today's projections end up being far off the mark. So we don't know everything about it. But one thing that we do know is that job preparation is at least part of the job of a modern university. It is not the only part, by any means. And direct education is also not the only role of the university. Universities, especially research universities, are doing critical research. They're finding new knowledge, they're curing patients, they're providing public service, and they're offering entertainment and enlightenment through cultural and athletic audiences. But still, the labor market implications of what we do is critical to the university's success. Much of what I'm gonna talk about here is drawn from my own experience as president of UVA, but I should say that I'm also a labor force demographer. And so the course I teach is called uh, the 21st Century Labor Market. And um, so I've had the opportunity with students to explore some of the topics I'm going to discuss with you here this morning. But let's start by talking about the parents. Parents send their sons and daughters to our universities with a mixture of emotions. There's hope, and there's fear, and ultimately there's faith. And each of these is important to understanding how the university does or fails to meet their expectations. Parents hope that their children are going to find a satisfying vocation when they graduate. But that's not all they hope for. They also hope their young graduate will be able to function well as a citizen, as a neighbor, as a family member, and that he or she will have discovered or more deeply rooted a set of core values. They hope that he or she will have acquired a group of friends and mentors for the coming years even after that parental generation passes away. But parents fear that these things will not happen. The Great Recession of 2008 turbocharged parental fears about their graduates. And for a while, the unemployment rate of college graduates rose, which seemed to confirm those fears. Although I should say that college uh, graduate unemployment rates never rose to the heights experienced by those with only a high school diploma. And neither of those compares with what happens to those who dropped out of high school. Today, with a long decade of recovery behind us, the labor market is so robust that now we're in the opposite situation for at least a while. Some graduates face a problem of which job to take, especially in some fields. And labor shortages plague some fields. I predict that in at least some areas you're going to begin seeing employers seeking to induce college juniors to leave college and come to work early for a bonus. Despite these changes in the labor market, there is still a cottage industry that preys on parental fears, suggesting college is not worthwhile, or at least some majors are not worthwhile and suggesting that every graduate must be sagging under a huge burden of loan debt, debt that they incurred after their parents took out the second mortgage on the house. While each of these fears can be refuted, and let me say that they are especially not true for the graduates of public research universities, they are potent undercurrents in the culture. But at the end of the day, most parents have faith that our universities strive to do the right thing by their students, to build good habits of reflection and analysis, to engage the issues of the day, and to do so in good faith and from good motives. They're proud to say that their sons and daughters have earned a college degree. They get out of their hospital beds to come to graduation if necessary. And they consider the degree to be an affirmation of their own parenting. 
And in my experience, parents also understand that college is a lot more than cramming knowledge into a cranium. Most of them understand that the knowledge conveyed in today's education, especially in some fields of science and engineering, is likely to be obsolete before their student reaches age 40, or maybe before then. But they have faith that their students learned to learn, and they've developed the habits of care and diligence that are going to keep them working even if the technology changes and their jobs become obsolete. And let me say that parents are not the only ones with these expectations of our universities. Every other stakeholder group echoes them, including the students themselves. University presidents are aware of these expectations, and they're anxious to meet them. But all of us are subject to the same limitation, which is we do not have a crystal ball. So let me tell you a crystal ball story. A good example occurred 45 years ago. In 1973, President Nixon signed the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, which, among other things, was supposed to help potential workers from disadvantaged backgrounds receive training and needed skills so that they could get jobs. So one such skill was key punching. Now, looking at this audience, I'm going to bet that some of you remember Yes, <laughs> key punch machines. A lot of us did our dissertations, uh, key punching data um, to enter into a computer. The computer was as big as a room. <laughs> so we're familiar with what the process is. Just the year before the president signed this act, there was an article in the Journal of Business Education that proclaimed key punching to be an essential skill that every student needed to learn. The demand for key punch operators had been high in the 1950s and 60s, and it was assumed that that demand would continue. So thousands of disadvantaged young people were offered their one shot at training for a job, becoming a key punch operator, at just about the time that job was beginning to disappear. So why did it disappear? Well, the job of a key punch operator is basically a job of data entry. It's a necessary, it was a necessary step to making the data machine readable. And then the data could be analyzed and stored. The key punch operator entered data onto a card, typically an 80 column Hollerith card, which was named for its inventor. I'm saying all this for those of you who are young enough that you've never seen one of these before. At really important industries where accuracy of data was essential, the cards then fed into a verifier, and the verifier clipped a corner off each card to show that the data were correct. Um, and a card reader then provided the interface to the computer. Well, we all agree that the need for data entry is ubiquitous. Every kind of firm and industry needs to be able to analyze its, in, its own data, not least the university. So there was high market demand, and training workers to meet that demand seemed like just the right thing to do. But the mistake was the assumption that the demand for this particular type of data entry would continue into the future without accounting for developments that were already taking shape, and by the way, taking shape in our own university laboratories that would change the technology. So while the task of data entry has not disappeared, it has been transformed. The use of intermediate media, such as Hollerith cards, mag cards, some of you probably remember those, or Scantron sheets, which some of you may still be using, <laughs> really became unnecessary because direct interfaces eliminated the need for those intermediate media and also eliminated the need for companies to invest in that equipment. And you were also able to provide storage at the same time that you did the data entry. You didn't have to worry about a climate-controlled warehouse to store these Hollerith cards, which, by the way, warped very easily with any kind of moisture around them. There was innovation in direct data entry in many ways. Word processing and various forms of software, such as Microsoft Word, and of course now we have audible data entry. Okay, so back in 1973, the effort to train key punch operators seemed sensible and humane. The work needed to be done, and the unemployed needed marketable skills. The problem was that before long, the key punch operators were once again unemployable. The problem was conceptualized improperly. 
Employers needed people to help their firms with data entry, but before long it wasn't key punch operators that they needed for data entry. People who had broader backgrounds in statistics, process engineering, computer science, and many other fields would make the breakthroughs that businesses needed, not the key punch operators. So, universities today are also pressured to meet immediate market demands for specific fields. And sometimes they do respond with something like the key punch operator experience. The first call is to shorten the length of study. Back in World War II, we had what were called 90-day wonders, who were first lieutenants, who, second lieutenants, who had only three months of preparation. They tended not to perform too well on the battlefield. The second response is to focus narrowly on immediate skills as opposed to education. That is, eliminate all those frill courses. One key difference between training and education is that training is narrow and skills-based, and it's often focused on the short-term needs of the employers. And frankly, employers who face labor shortages, as many now do, clamor for the university to do exactly this kind of preparation. I think a, school, a skills toolkit is a useful thing to acquire in college, but I think education is also a broader process. And that broader process is the safeguard against becoming unemployable in the future. And education involves conceptualization, design, understanding underlying principles, comparisons with other interesting problems, and learning multiple tools for problem solving. All too often, focusing on just the job that's waiting at graduation is producing another key puncher. There will be a job right away, but will they face the threat of technological obsolescence when a new development makes their jobs redundant? The grim reality here is that those who are acquiring the education are inexorably also the ones who develop the technologies to make the equivalent of key punch operators redundant. So let me go back to parental fears and anxieties. The stakes are high in making decisions about how to educate our students because of the great underlying fear that the years of recession and even depression are going to return. This anxiety really looms large in the older generations, parents and grandparents, who saw a rise in job insecurity either for themselves or their friends. And it's reflected in some of their students who seek safety and security and who fret about risk taking. Now, not every one of our current students is risk averse, but a goodly, sec a goodly sector of them are. One result of the Great Recession in 2008 was that for the first time, rounds of layoffs began to hit high in the occupation income structure. Layoffs had been common for blue collar workers whenever work became slack. So, for example, it was written into the collective bargaining agreements of the United Auto Workers that there would be periodic layoffs for model changeover every year when the new car models were introduced. But then came the Rust Belt period and the factories were closed and laid off became a euphemism for unemployed. In the late 1980s and 1990s, the previously safe white collar jobs became vulnerable to layoffs. Lean management techniques led to increasing the span of control for managers, often aided by technology, and that meant that many middle managers became redundant. And in 2008, the pink slips began flying everywhere and families that had always been economically safe began to experience economic insecurity. They and their creditors had both believed they were safe. Now they were unemployed, mortgages were overdue, and many of them faced foreclosure, bankruptcy, and even homelessness. So one effect of that recession was a palpable anxiety among parents about whether their college-aged children would find jobs after graduation. And with college costs rising, college looked like a luxury that wasn't worthwhile unless the return on investment was going to be pretty strong. I was working at the University of Michigan then, and the effects in Ann Arbor were immediate and dire. Factories closed, businesses laid off employees, and the future looked bleak. The iconic River Rouge plant in Ypsilanti, near to Ann Arbor, closed. And with the other two major car manufacturers, the unthinkable happened. Chrysler and General Motors declared Chapter 11 bankruptcy. 
All of us remember how painful it was in those days to talk with a parent who would whisper with shame, I've lost my job. Please don't let my son know because he'll worry about it. Or the frustrated students who would say, I hate accounting, but my parents insist that I major in a safe area. And there were staff members who became painfully risk averse in clinging to their jobs. I can't afford to make any mistakes here because my husband got laid off, and if I lose my job, we won't have any health insurance. The result in the university was pressure from many directions to prepare students for safe jobs. And underlying these fears was the belief that there were safe jobs, jobs that could not be disrupted, jobs that would be needed no matter what happened in the economy. The problem was parents and others were looking backwards to try and figure out what would be safe going forwards. Now we see one industry after another disrupted, journalism and retail trade being two obvious examples. And so it's easy for me to tell you that I think it's hard to project that any occupation is safe. After all, the Japanese are developing robots to care for the elderly and the sick. Tasks that we might have thought too intimate for any but skilled healthcare workers to undertake. And as if uh, identifying safe jobs are not already a challenge, we also must adjust to the changed expectation of our graduates with respect to work. Millennial workers often plan to change jobs fairly often, now to the dismay of their employers. They also have different preferences in terms of uh, work family balance, the variety of the tasks they actually do, and the shape of the workplace hierarchy. It is possible for us to produce graduates who are continuously employable, but it might all, not always be in the same field. The current projections are the average graduate today will be in at least three different fields, not firms or jobs, three different fields uh, during their careers. So just as we know that the knowledge that they get in the classroom is gonna need periodic refreshing, the learning to learn, we can focus on the worker characteristics that employers tell us make our students more employable. So I spent a lot of time talking to employers as president at UVA, and one thing I heard a lot was that employers were looking for what they call soft skills. They would say they're very satisfied with the quality of technical knowledge graduates had but it was the soft skills that they were looking for. These are skills such as interpersonal competence and the ability to work well in groups, especially groups that include people from other backgrounds and other cultures. Many American companies today are doing work all over the world, and they put together a task force that has members who come from all over the world. They want workers who communicate well, orally and in writing. And by the way, communicating in a second language is a big plus. They want workers who understand complexity and who can be creative in thinking of ways to address complex problems. And they want workers with curiosity and a desire to continue to improve. I think you can develop all of these skills with a college major, often, a college, uh, often any college major. And remember that a major is often only a quarter of the total college experience. Some of these skills we can, uh, we can improve because we improve our own pedagogy. For example, more writing, more oral presentations, and more group work can help make our graduates better communicators and develop more of those interpersonal skills. I know two UVA graduates who majored in English with a concentration in poetry. They're both very well compensated writers for a noted cosmetic firm in New York City. It turns out that poetic descriptions of cosmetics are powerful motivators. <laughs> Foreign language and culture study, study abroad, and opportunities to work with diverse and international students help to build the ability to interact well with others. We're proud at the University of Virginia that our students come from 125 countries. It's a great opportunity for our American-born students to interact with people from many different backgrounds. One of my first-year advisees lived with a roommate from Peru. And when Thanksgiving came, his parents, who lived in Northern Virginia, invited the Peruvian roommate to come experience a typical American Thanksgiving with turkey and all the trimmings. 
Well, the Peruvian parents were very grateful, and so in return, they offered uh, the American roommate um, a trip to Peru for three weeks at their expense in the summer. <laughs> well, the American student went to Peru, and he was completely amazed by what he found. Came back and said to me, you know, I'd been thinking that I'm interested in business and I'd be focused on Asia, he said, but now I think Latin America is the place I should focus. And he's now employed in a firm, and his interest in Latin America was the reason that they wanted to hire him. And that all goes back to meeting that Peruvian roommate and his family. I think that understanding complexity is often aided by trying a course in a completely new subject and then finding linkages to one's major. UVA medical students all take a unit with an art historian because it turns out that the close study of a painting develops skills very similar to those that physicians need in closely observing patients for symptoms. I find that students who attempt interdisciplinary courses are excited by the opportunity to explore the intellectual boundary lines and to see how wicked problems can be addressed. UVA students in engineering, business, urban planning, architecture, and environmental studies, to take one example, have found common ground in studying design thinking. I also think we at the university can do more to remove the barriers to having our students become those perennially employable workers. We can create intermediate badges and certificates as signals to employers of the skill set the students have. We can remove barriers to pursuing joint degrees or majors. And we can seek flexibility for students who are in highly structured curricula, such as nursing and engineering, so that they still have the opportunity to study abroad. I believe we will also have to pay more attention to comeback programs. These are programs that will allow those students who get lured away from us in the junior year with the promise of a bonus to nevertheless complete their degree. University of Texas San Antonio had this experience where uh, lots, lots of their uh, computer science people got recruited away. And their comeback program was very important in the recession because all the studies will show you that people who have completed the degree have a big boost in the labor market over people who have merely attended college. I think faculty development is something we need to pay attention to in a new way. Faculty need to have interaction with advisory boards who come from employers. They need to have the opportunity to do sabbaticals not only at other universities, but also in other workplaces. I think we should recharge the faculty exchanges with industry, which we once did with companies such as IBM, in which a faculty member went to IBM and an IBM worker came to the university, actually to the benefit of both. And I think we should consider more cooperative capstones for senior students in which business and faculty cooperate with each other to produce a, a course. As all these examples suggest, I believe a liberal arts curriculum is still a good preparation for work, but it needs a few tweaks. We want our graduates to be more than workers. We also want them to be effective citizens, neighbors, parents, and so we need to give them a chance to reflect through courses in philosophy, the arts, religious studies, theoretical mathematics, anthropology, and geography. And I haven't yet mentioned critical thinking. But we obviously want our students to have sufficient literacy that they can identify what is a fact. And I don't mean just in the obvious political context, but I also mean <laughs> just in terms of being effective consumers. Above all, universities should not leave these thorny issues about labor market inter interface to administrators and politicians. Students deserve to hear about these debates and participate in them. In my own experience, students are eager to learn about the workforce, whether it's through a course in labor economics or my own course in the sociology of work. Just one course can give a student the skills to become his or her own job counselor. It helps them know where to look if the day comes that a pink slip lands on their desk. Demystifying what people actually do at work is enlightening and energizing to students, and it makes them more adventuresome in their own job search. And parents are often energized by these materials their students are reading in my class, because they also want a broader overview of what's happening in the marketplace. It's a good use of the student fee dollar 
to invest in facilities to help them interface with employers. Resume critiques, mock interviews, job search boot camps, networking seminars, and many other activities help that novice job seeker find the first job. I think universities have a role to play in helping graduates find jobs, but I don't think that role is simple. Indeed, it's the kind of complex issue that the college educated love to tackle, and I know the University of Utah is up to the task. I'm looking forward to hearing the subsequent discussion, and then I'm sure all of us would be happy to answer questions. Thanks for having me here today. So I'm Dan Reed. I'm the newly uh, uh, appointed Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs here at the University of Utah, filling large shoes in a, a lot of ways uh, to follow Ruth Watkins. Uh, welcome. I was thinking as Terry was talking about a wonderful little essay written by Abraham Flexner uh, in 1939. He's perhaps uh, best known in academic circles for being the founding director of Princeton, uh, Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, and in, a, in that essay, written in 1939, Flexner remarked on the power of an institution that frees successive generations of human souls. And that is and fundamentally what I believe we're in the business of doing. But as we think about the changing world in which we live, as we've heard already, the shifting demographics, uh, the nature of our student body, let me offer just a few other thoughts to frame this discussion uh, about the public university and tomorrow's workforce as we look at preparing students to succeed in a global economy. Think about the nature, uh, as President Sullivan mentioned, about the, the, the effects of technology, and I saw that myself as a vice president at Microsoft years ago, as we look at, okay. <laughs> as we look at the effects of technology and its disintermediation dis and disruption of entire economic sectors, the accelerating pace of change, what Toffer called future shock, uh, and the whole set of nature uh, that accrue from that. One other trend that we have not talked about is rising urbanization. Today, over 50% of the people on this planet live in cities, and by 2050, over 70% of the people live in cities. A majority of those in megacities of 10 million people or more. So there are huge shifts taking place in our student body. One last thing I would say as we think about preparing students uh, for a global workforce, is remember that the majority of our undergraduates are now what we would have historically called non-traditional students, which is to say they're often working full or part-time, they may have children, and they may be supporting themselves, they may not be full-time students, they're juggling many different aspects of their lives. And it's within that backdrop that we think about what it means to live in a global world. And so with that, uh, let me briefly introduce our panel. We have Jane Hart, who's Executive VP of Human Resources at Myriad Genetics, uh, Courtney McBath, who's Special Assistant to President Watkins, and also Project Director of the American Dream Ideas Challenge, uh, Taylor Randall, who's Dean of the Eccles School of Business, uh, and Barb Wilson, who is Executive uh, Vice President uh, for Academic Affairs uh, at uh, an institution that Ruth and I both share, the University of Illinois. Uh, so here's what we're gonna do in this panel. I've asked each of the panel members to offer a brief statement. Uh, we have a, a brief video that we will show. I will ask just a few framing questions, and then this is your chance to participate because there is an audience participation section of this. No prize, I'm afraid, uh, but an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, and so why don't we just go in the order that I mentioned, and we'll start with Jane. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here um, with all of you, and I feel like it's an honor to be in this room with such smart, intelligent people that we should be able to 
solve and come up with some great solutions, as um, the president mentioned earlier, by the end of the day. Um, I'm in a unique situation today because I have a daughter that just graduated from another well-known university here in Utah. And today, <laughs> she is going through her first real job interview to try and determine if she can get the position that she's interested in. And so we've had a lot of opportunity to kind of discuss over the last several days what she needed to do to be prepared walking into that interview. And um, she said, I feel very confident about my technical skills, but I'm very uncertain about some of the softer skills that they're asking questions about in regards to how will you fit into a team? What makes you different from the other individuals that we're talking to? And so she really had to put some thought into some of those softer skills. And I think those are becoming more and more important um, as our previous presenter mentioned, that um, to employers and to um, myriad genetics, we look a lot at how adaptable are these students that are coming into the organization. Are they going to be able to thrive in the organization through a tremendous amount of change because companies are um, changing in an incredible fast pace um, these days, we're going through acquisitions, um, and it's impacting the people that we have. Can they adapt to that? Do they have those critical thinking skills to solve problems? We have a lot of customer service reps within our organization, and they are dealing with very complex issues. So they have to have those critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, to actually address the needs of the physicians and the, and the patients that they're working with. There's a huge disruption in healthcare. We are moving towards personalized medicine, which means that each individual is eventually going to be able to receive the proper treatment based on their own personal DNA. So we are going through a tremendous amount of change, and hopefully we're preparing these students um, to actually adapt and thrive in that organization. Not only students, but also our other workers in the workforce, how um, agile are they? Do, are they resilient to change as well? Are they continually learning? Because if they are not also continually learning, they're not going to keep pace with the people that are coming into the, into the workforce. So we have a lot of opportunity. It's very exciting. I'm happy to be a part of that, and it's exciting to see the passion and the energy that's coming out of this group, too, to try and solve these problems. Great, so I'm so happy to be here today. I'll take a slightly different angle, and that is the assumption that we're helping students get across the degree finish line. So when we think about preparing students, if they have some college but no degree, we're setting them up for failure, right? They have debt, they don't have the degree to have the increased earnings to then pay off that debt. So um, one thing that we've been thinking about, and President Watkins and a small team of us have been working on, is a new type of financial aid tool that might help students. Um, in Utah, particularly University of Utah, we have sort of two trends or dynamics that really impact our students. And, um, is, for the state of Utah, it's debt aversion, right? So this is, debt aversion is a good thing, but it's um, almost so detrimental that our students start and stop. So if they can't meet a $2,000 financial aid gap, then they'll stop out and be a barista for a semester. So what we're trying to be mindful of is making sure our students um, can finish in a more timely fashion and actually get that degree to then have the increase in earnings. Um, also helping students understand the opportunity loss as they prolong their degree completion. Uh, so we're, we're looking at a tool called an income share agreement that will help fill that financial aid gap after grants and scholarships to help our students stay in 
stay at the university and finish their degree so that they can increase their earnings over time. So I think that's one aspect we really want to think of is the unique dynamic of Utah with debt aversion and that starting and stopping. Taylor? I think about once a week, I have a faculty member come to me and say, my students are working too much. If only they had time to listen to me more. Now you might. <laughs> Like now, now you might, yeah, you, know, you might think for a moment that is uh, that is a bit self-centered and arrogant, um, but I agree with them, right? For a moment in your life, you have a time to pause and learn a set of problem-solving skills that are supposed to solve the problems of unemployment, and yet for a large, large set of our students, they face a set of financial difficulties and financial stresses that are very, very difficult to get around. Um, as Dan mentioned, many of our students are actually non-traditional at this point. So why can't we do both at once? Why can't we take work and education and mix them together? And I think that is the grand experiment that we're trying to run as a university with a nonprofit <coughs> called Education at Work. Education at Work partners right now with Microsoft Corporation, and they hire our students to do customer service in the Microsoft Office Suite. They try to create flexible work schedules. They provide some pay. They're very, they work very, very closely with each student to make sure they're attending class on time. And then on top of the pay, and right now it's about $1.2 million of pay that they provide to our students, they give our students training in the current technology of Microsoft, and they help Microsoft customers solve all of their problems. As incentives to those students to not work all the time on Microsoft's problems, they also provide scholarships, up to $6,000 a year. And how do you get that scholarship? You have to do well in school, <laughs> you have to attend school full time, and they're trying to get you out at the same time. It's a wonderful partnership. Right now we've just announced an, another uh, contract with Discover. Um, so we've got another potentially 150 to 200 students that can get involved in this. It's been a fantastic partnership that again allows students to learn a set of skills, those problem solving skills, often complex prob sol problem solving skills, but also interpersonal skills. It's really a challenge to talk to someone, I know I am this person who's angry at midnight because Microsoft Word has crashed and there's something due at three o'clock in the morning because a grant's gotta be submitted and there's that student on the other side, uh, on the other side of the phone saying, hey, I get it, I'm in the university right now. I've, I've, I've dealt with people like you. Um, <laughs> Anyway, it's been a fun, it's been a fun partnership. Uh, it's still in its infancy, but I think it shows uh, tremendous promise. Barb. Good morning, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here from the University of Illinois and to just tell you that as I was leaving, I can't even count the number of people that said, tell Ruth we miss her, tell Ruth congratulations. <laughs> um, and so I just want to say, because I won't have an opportunity to say it later, that you all got a good one, and we all <laughs> lost someone. And so <laughs> kudos to you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Ruth, I know I'm embarrassing you, but I had to say that. Um, so uh, Terry said this morning that she would set us up really nicely, she hoped, for, for this panel, and I think she did. One of the things, my background is communication, and so when I hear uh, uh, that important skills include written and oral communication, it just makes me feel really good, because uh, we teach that in my home department, and we think about that broadly, but it turns out that so do employers. And the, a very recent study, 2018, of 1,000 CEOs and hiring managers asked, what skills are you looking for in college graduates? And it turns out they're exactly the kinds of things that Terry mentioned, oral and written communication, ability to work in teams, the ability to think critically about problems, Turns out ethical judgment was on the list of the top five. And when I think about all of those, those are the heart of a liberal education. 
Uh, and I, I want to challenge us on a couple of fronts. One, I think we have to quit calling these soft skills. So um, it drives me, and, and no offense, everybody does it, but it drives me crazy because they aren't soft. They're actually really hard to learn these skills. <laughs> And when we call them soft skills, we kind of undermine them, as if the hard sciences and then the soft skills. And in my mind, it takes a lot of work to think about the world from a multicultural perspective, to work in teams, to think about how to communicate to your audience, to shift from one moment to another, depending upon who your audience is. Those are not soft skills. I think the universities don't do a service to our students and to the majors that support those skills when we call them soft. So let's rebrand that. Let's think about them as higher order skills or something like that. I don't really like emotional intelligence because that too kind of has its own baggage. But as I was sitting there, I'm sorry, but I was sitting there and thinking, what is it? It's higher order skills that we're teaching college graduates so that they can be uh, really incredible citizens in the world. Uh, the other thing I think universities have to do a better job of is trying to find combinations of majors. And departments are pretty siloed, and we protect IUs and credits, and we don't want to get outside of our comfort zone. But it turns out the millennials today don't want to just major in accounting. They might want, as we heard, accounting and poetry. Or at the University of Illinois, we've started this whole CS plus X, computer science plus, because everybody wants to major in computer science. But it turns out that that in and of itself may not actually help students prepare for the workforce. So we have a major called CS plus philosophy and CS plus linguistics, and now CS plus anthropology. And these are really popular majors that allow students to combine the higher order skills they're interested in with some of the technical STEM related skills. So I think that is something we really have to think about for the future. I have a lot of other ideas, but I think I'll stop right now. <laughs> All right, thank you, panel. We have a brief video uh, that highlights the importance of undergraduate research experiences and translating into a career. This is a, a former student named Ryan Watts. I'm at currently a CEO of a biotech company in the San Francisco Bay Area. Formerly, I was an undergraduate at the University of Utah um, before going on to get a PhD. And I really wish I could join uh, today in person to celebrate Ruth Watkins' inauguration, but unfortunately, we're un unable to attend uh, based on work obligations. Uh, my company is focused on inventing medicines for Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and ALS. Uh, we're really a science-driven organization, and everything we do is based on the underlying biology of the diseases that we're working on. I first fell in love with biology at the University of Utah as an undergrad. In fact, I was an undergraduate researcher and still remember vividly the time I spent in the microscope room uh, working with fruit flies for the first time and being inspired by the fact that we were making discoveries at the cutting edge. And it was, it was that passion that came about as my, at my time at the University of Utah that has basically led uh, the rest of my career. Uh, going initially trying to understand how the nervous system develops at University of Utah and at Stanford uh, to now how the nervous system degenerates in diseases of aging like Alzheimer's disease. And ultimately with the goal of inventing medicines that can uh, cure these diseases, um, but really with the motivation to understand the biology and improve people's lives. I really see a major advantage to the experience I had as an undergraduate at the University of Utah. The education broadly but also very specifically um, around biology and the professors in biology. I can't imagine not having that foundation as a starting point to then go on to a career that really um, you know, utilizes that knowledge to then invent, uh, in our case, medicines for, for, for patients. We now take advantage of the same public education in the Bay Area, uh, UCSF or, or UC Berkeley, but obviously for me, I have a, a very um, uh, specific affinity for the University of Utah and also my public education all the way from elementary school through college. With that backdrop, let me uh, um, throw out a few questions to begin the discussion. As I said, I hope you've been thinking about questions you want to ask as well, because we'll have some time for that. So when one thinks about a world in which a team member so might be from Bangalore or Rio, uh, Shanghai, and oh yes, maybe Chicago or Salt Lake City, 
um, in a world of accelerating change where entire economic sectors can be disrupted or even destroyed uh, in a span of five to ten years, how do we think about the sustainable skills that will serve our students well, not for their first job or even their second job, but perhaps their eighth job? So what are those 10 to 20 year sustainable skills, panel? I can start out on one that we really haven't talked about, and that's being more self-aware. Because I do think that if we don't teach that, it's difficult for someone to recognize and understand that, especially if they're working in a team or on a cross-functional team to know what their behaviors are contributing to that team. And so asking for feedback, getting comfortable with receiving feedback on a continual and regular basis is also one of, it's one of those sustainable skills that I think will actually allow these students to be much more successful. And it's difficult for people to accept feedback at some times, so if they get comfortable to it, um, they're gonna be that much more successful. I think another area is um, looking at failure in a positive way. And being able to um, accept your failures, learn from them, grow, and quickly move on. So reflect on why you failed, but also reflect on what you could do differently to be more successful the next time. So you know, as you reflect, redirect um, that energy into a new positive energy that you can contribute to the team. Just a couple of things. Anyone else? Uh, I, I want to give some perspective. I, I did a little research on this question. He gave me like last night to think about this, <laughs> so thanks. Um, so I looked up, this is the World Economic uh, Forum list of critical, I don't know, characteristics, tasks uh, that people need. Complex problem solving, uh, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others, emotional intelligence, judgment and decision making, uh, service orientation, negotiation, and cognitive flexibility. Now interestingly, if you take that list and look at the lists that project out 20 years and also the ones that were issued in 1940s, there, it's actually the same list of things. Um, and so either we're not teaching them well or there are some constants, right, that if we teach, we'll prepare people for the future. One of the things we try to do uh, because we're about business and entrepreneurship is teach an entrepreneurial mindset. I think it is broadly applicable. And the basic steps to an entrepreneurial mindset are identify a problem, learn to identify problems, create solutions, build a team around it, test the model of the solution, and then try, fail, try, try again. And I think those basic entrepreneurial skills actually, actually capture many of the things that are on these lists that we see of skills that are needed for the future. Higher order skills, right? Not yeah. soft skills. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Higher order skills. Yeah, I would just add, I think um, it's really important to help students think about change and change management because the fact of the matter is everything's changing all the time. And we know how risk averse many of us are and how we like things to be the same. That is sort of a human condition, if you will. But if we don't help our students think about the fact that everything they do when they leave a university is gonna involve change, and how do you anticipate that? How do you actually embrace it? And how do you become part of it? I think that is a disservice to our students. So that's really important and it doesn't show up in a lot of the higher order skills that we've talked about. I think one thing I've been thinking about was I watch my 12, nine, and six-year-old play Fortnite. Now any parent in the room will wish that this game never existed. They have coaches for that now. They do, and as I'm, as I'm looking at these If you don't lists, know what Fortnite is, see her after. <laughs> Keep it out of your house. No, the, the, the 10 skills that Taylor talks about though, um, I think the difference is our, stu our young kids who are hitting college doorsteps nowadays are drastically different than students we've had in the past. They've had 24 seven access with a smartphone and my six year old is negotiating with kids from across the world from different cultures, different languages. They're building teams within 100 people in this game set trying to figure out how you can be the last one to make it and that requires problem solving. It requires failing and trying again. And so I think 
our kids are grasping these skills in a digital context. So I think the question we have to ask is how do we harness and leverage those strengths that they're gaining in this digital world that's rapidly changing and translate that to our current institutions. Any other thoughts? Well, one of the things that I think is also interesting as we look at the pace of change is higher education has rightly but historically focused on 18 to 20 somethings. In a world where uh, knowledge is doubling literally every handful of years and the broad shifts sociologically and economically that I just described, what's the role and mechanism via which universities think about lifelong partnerships and just-in-time education uh, that will help our citizens be successful and competitive in a global world? Um, I can go first. I think um, creating more online self-paced learning opportunities for students is helpful because as they're looking at different opportunities and they're exploring what their interests are leading them to, they may need to learn something new from a new technology or um, something new that's going to help them be more successful in that role. And so if they have opportunities to kind of learn at their own pace based on what they're experiencing at that time, it's going to be very helpful for them. And I think that as um, employers partner better with universities to come up with programs that actually can extend and deepen the skills that these students are bringing to these new roles because of innovation is going to be um, very helpful. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And at, at the University of Illinois, we're talking a lot about what it means to be in the business of alumnihood, which is something that is a new term that we're hearing increasingly, the idea that we, ha we have to have lifelong partnerships with our students. Um, when they leave at whatever age, 22, 23, 24, I don't know uh, how old they're going to get eventually if, they, if the population keeps aging. but. Um, they're not done learning, and there are so many opportunities for them to engage in online education. Wouldn't we, as their home institution, want to be the place of first choice? And I think you have to start communicating that to students the minute they leave, and maybe even before that, that we want you back. We don't want you back just to give money to us, although you know we won't turn that down. But, um, <laughs> but more importantly, we want you to come back here for the needs that you're going to have as you evolve as a citizen and as an employee in whatever occupation you're going to be. And I think it's on us to think about educating beyond the undergraduate and, and really thinking about how do we do that in place, space, and time, and also how do we communicate to, to our, our alums that we're the place to come back to. So, You know, um, I just want to make an observation about how the traditional MBA degree has evolved over time. Um, uh, the traditional day MBA work for two years and then spend two years is, uh, I guess, to many considered dead at this point. Yet the MBA degree itself is flourishing. We offer four MBAs. We offer a traditional MBA, we offer a nighttime MBA, we offer an executive MBA, and we offer an online MBA. If you look at the age span of simply that MBA, it ranges from 23 years old to 55, right? Teaching a set of skills all along the way, and some of these, I would say, higher order skills of, of management negotiation that you're trying, trying to provide. Then on top of that, we have certain programs, because the MBA does charge an exorbitant amount, basically offering a set of lifetime products, right? So if you get an MBA from us, you now have access to a set of executive education offerings uh, whenever you would like. And again, those are delivered uh, at your place of business or on campus or online as you want to consume. I think there's some interesting models to observe as we see what is happening to MBA education. Mm -hmm. And I would just add to that this uh, notion of upskilling. So it's 
it's the balancing act of what Terry talked about, that we're not going to create key punch operators, our version this century, but there are some certain skills that folks want to come in and get in a flexible, sort of timely manner. So how do we think about digital badges and certificates and flexible offerings, particularly for families who are trying to juggle other jobs and, and children and other um, obligations and thinking more flexibly in how we offer those? Well, we just saw a video that illustrated the impact of an undergraduate research and scholarship experience in, in shaping the career uh, of a graduate. As we think about the increasing interdependence of knowledge, the consilience of ideas, one of the great challenges that strikes me as we teach our students uh, in individual classes is helping them see that interdependence because it's a very wise and mature 18-year-old who can see that five separate classes may in fact be lenses on the same idea. So any thoughts on in this intersection of, and I won't use soft skills, <laughs> uh, idea of, of the ability to interact with people in an effective way as well as domain-specific knowledge, that we help people fuse not only those technical insights, but an understanding of the world and the society in which they live as they make those important, not only business, but ethical and life choices. I, I think students have so many more choices today to consider than we ever had in the past. And they can pursue their personal interest. I mean, I grew up with the quote, you know, seek your passion and you're going to be successful. Go after your passion. Well, when I was growing up, that was a little bit more difficult because I loved art and I knew I was never really going to be, you know, highly successful from a artistic standpoint. And so I had to go after some different opportunities. Well, today you can actually become an Uber driver and pursue your interests in art, you know, and deepen your skills there. So students have so much more opportunity to be able to explore and to be successful in those areas that they truly have interest in. And we have to be able to be accepting of that and encourage that, encourage them to be their own entrepreneurs. Uh, that's really truly seeking kind of their own, they're learning their own mini MBA because they have to understand every aspect of business, not just one specific skill. And so we are encouraging them to be a lot more well-rounded than what they have been in the past in coming out with just a targeted, maybe career goal in one field or one area. Um, I want to just point out uh, two of my colleagues that run the Lassonde Entrepreneur Institute. So uh, Kathy and Troy that are here today, raise, raise your hands because this is all credit to you. They've, they're, they're, they're creating some magic in an entrepreneurial dorm that's really remarkable. This dorm has 400 students, 44 different majors from business to engineering to arts, and there's some crazy things that happen there all along this interdisciplinary uh, line of thinking. So two randomly assigned roommates, a business student and an electrical engineering student, start complaining about their hitchhiking uh, because they've got all these electronics and they can't carry all the batteries and plugs that they've got you know, to use to keep them, keep, keep them going, and they're losing them all the time. So they sit down and they create an integrated battery cord plug, right, that will solve their problem here in the Lassonde Entrepreneur Center. Troy has a program called Get Seated. And so if you show up once a month, they're giving away $10,000 in grants to students. And the way you earn that is you just show up with as many of your friends possible and you vote. And then you get them to vote for you. That in and of itself, <laughs> right, is an entrepreneurial idea. <laughs> So they ask for $500 to create a prototype, and lo and behold, here comes this prototype, right? And about six months later, they show up and they say, we think this thing's gonna work, but we need to go to China, and we need to get this thing sourced. And so they bring all their friends back and they ask for $3,000 for plane tickets to go to China. Now, by the way, this started as a freshman and sophomore, then now they're a sophomore and junior, and lo and behold, they make it to China and back in the middle of the semester. Don't tell the professors, right? And they've now got a source to build their, build, build their prototype. 
They took that idea then to a business plan competition, and they won $50,000 at the business <laughs> plan competition, right? And, and now all of a sudden, we've got one that's finally graduated, and the another's that's a senior, and they're trying to now sell this product into Best Buy, right? What an incredible inter interdisciplinary experience that they've had while at the University of Utah. So, Kathy, Troy, thank you very much for providing those experiences for students. Really appreciate it. When Taylor first told me that story, my first reaction was buying pizza for your friends to stack the vote to step zero in applied marketing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's turn the, uh, the floor uh, open for questions for the panel. Yes. So let me try to briefly repeat the question for the benefit of the people who are watching the stream because they may not have preferred it. So the gist of the question, as I understood it, was in a world of change where we're seeing shifting demographics and some structural inequalities, how do we think about these issues? I had a recent experience because um, at Myriad, we we're actually going through a major acquisition with a company in South San Francisco. And it's a very young, dynamic technology company that we are bridging with our technology at Myriad Genetics. And the first day I walked in there, I was like kind of taken aback because it is full of millennials. And so I looked at that group and their questions are very different than the questions that we would get from our typical employee population at Myriad. They are, in a, they are more interested in disruption, innovation, making sure that they can truly make a difference, and they want to do it in a very short time frame um, because they're off to their next opportunity. And so being able to kind of adapt to that environment is going to be a real challenge for employers out there as these emerging students and their creativity comes into the workforce, workforce, we've got to be able to adapt to that. And we've got to think differently. It requires our communication to change because they're thinking differently. And so we can't get away with some of the things that maybe we have tried to put by the wayside and ignore. We actually have to address it now. And it's requiring employers to be better communicators and to provide more development and to bridge the gaps that we currently have out there in our workforce today. So I do think there's a strong movement that this millennial generation is bringing into the workforce that is really changing the dynamics. They want us to move quicker. They don't like the way that we've been doing things in the past. And so you can't use the excuse, well, this is how we've always done it. They just don't accept that and they're willing to kind of cut through that and create a lot of disruption around that. So I'm excited about it, but it is going to require employers to really change and, and adapt and um, do things differently. I'd like to follow up on your social equality aspect of your question, which I think is really important. One of the things that we have to do, I think, as educators, is make sure that our students are thinking deeply about problems, not just about how do you make money or how do you innovate or how do you be creative, which is what they often care about, but what impact will that have on people and on communities? And will that enhance inequality? And what effect will it have on families who don't have the resources that might be able to utilize the kinds of things you're creating? So I think as we move forward, we have to engage in what's often called design thinking or something like that where we're bringing students who are thinking about sociology and thinking about cultural studies and thinking about poverty and thinking about communities and families into the design process so that we're not just thinking about innovation, but we're thinking about the impact on people. And I think that's a university responsibility, however we can do that, so that we don't isolate our business students or our engineers in these fun widget moments without bringing in our humanists and our, our artists and our design folks to say, you know what, there are people out there that are going to have to engage with whatever you're creating, and it's going to have impact on different kinds of people depending on where they come from, so. All right, we have, sorry, please oh. go ahead, Courtney. 
So Rosie, I'd love to tell a story of two students that we met this week, um, Dennis and Jesus. Uh, they both described how they grew up, they went to Granger High School, and both of them are the first in their family to graduate from high school and will be the first to graduate from college. And their interaction with the University of Utah came from um, Jesus's dad worked construction on campus. And from the time he grew up, his dad said, this is the best university, you have to go here. And Dennis said goodbye to his grandpa uh, in a room in health sciences um, dying of cancer. And to see the hope on these two students' faces to say, we had an opportunity to come to the University of Utah, I'm proud to say that the University of Utah is a public university that is still providing pathways for students like that. And I think as we move forward with college um, affordability, and with pathways for opportunity success with what University Neighborhood Partners is doing and others, the programs like Education at Work, I think we have to be really mindful that we continue to build those programs so that students like Jesus and Dennis have the opportunity to come to the University of Utah. I think that's one of the most pressing issues we need to be thinking about. All right, we have time for one quick question. David Bjorkman, School of Medicine. As I listen to all of the attributes that you've been talking about that we want to provide our students, I can't help but think of all of the online universities that provide very little of those attributes, that they are transmitting knowledge perhaps with their online education. And while uh, internet-based education can be a great adjunct to the university experience, there's no substitute for the university experience in my mind. And I wonder if you could reflect on that. Um, I'll take this because we're, we've been struggling with this as a college, how to use uh, online educa education. We certainly have an online MBA. Well, let me describe it maybe in, in the following way and also speak a little bit to the last, last question. I, we've thought a lot about how we deal with inequality uh, and the issues of our day and how we teach that. And we stumbled across kind of an interesting, uh, I would say, experience that may be very generalizable. So we sent 20 students uh, to London under the tutelage of Marty Bradley, and she taught a class, very in-person class, uh, where it was called the City of Text, and she asked our students to describe the neighborhoods of London, one in particular, and the students came back and they said, we were there at night and we noticed that there were no women on the street. And the, <coughs> the discussion of the why, right, the discussion of the why was the first time for many of these students they realized they needed to think outside of their own circumstances. Now what does that have to do with online education? They could have that experience in London because they were still taking two or three classes back home <laughs> via online education. So what we did is we broke apart the tyranny of the classroom, right, and put students in a situation where they had a complete emotional engagement with what was going on. And I think for us who are trying to create experiences for students, that's the, the that's to us, that's, that's the key for, for online education. All right, well, we've come uh, basically to the end of our time. I do want to remind us as we talk about online education and technologies and the pace of change to remember the eternal verity, and that is that we are in the business of enabling the hopes of parents and the dreams of children. And the mechanisms via which we do that shift as our society evolves and changes. But that eternal truth defines the mission of higher education. Uh, and although the answers may change, that deep and abiding question is with us always. And so it's important to think, as we talk about mechanisms, to always remember the why. Mm -hmm. And with that, let me thank our panel. Okay, we have one more speaker before our break, so I'm going to turn the time over to Nina. 
and I'm happy to introduce that speaker. So it is an honor for me to introduce Dr. Denise Huftelin, who was named the president of Salt Lake Community College in 2014, where she had served for more than two decades prior to being named president. As president, she has launched a, a college-wide strategic plan which has produced a new vision, mission, values, and strategic goals for the college. President Huftelin is leading efforts to increase student success, transfer pathways, workforce responsiveness, and completion. President Huftelin has taught in uh, the Education, Leadership, and Policy Program at the University of Utah. She serves on a number of national, state, community, boards, and committees. And Dr. Huftelin earned a master's degree um, from UCLA and a doctorate degree in Education, Leadership, and Policy from the University of Utah. President Huftelin's influences reaches far beyond the Salt Lake Community Campus, as she has significantly contributed to the statewide conversation on the need to reach underserved populations, improve the lives of students, the value of education to the future success and prosperity of Utah. My friend, Dr. Huftelin. So good morning. It's clear to me that I stand between you and a break, and so I um, am going to uh, hopefully speak meaningfully but rapidly. Um, and I want to, before I get into my remarks, just reflect on the learning and the affirmation that I've already had listening to the previous speakers. Uh, it's, it's not um, lost on me that 35 years ago when President Gardner was talking about a nation at risk. I was a junior undergraduate student here at the University of Utah, I'm probably walking across that plaza, never knowing that uh, 35 years later I might be standing as a president among colleagues um, as a result of the public education or the public university education that I received. So uh, kudos to UCLA and the University of Utah for giving me those opportunities. Um, it's also a very clear to me now uh, that Terry's former student, who is the poet um, cosmetic designer, um, has found a customer in me. <laughs> because as I was listening to her, I realized as I reach every morning for this particular jar of serum that is, is going to help me anti-age, <laughs> I was struck and have spent thousands of dollars on this stuff. And this is the name of it, and I kid you not, when hope is not enough. Uh, this graduate wrote that, and I bought it. So, there you go, my skincare regime in one modus. So, uh, seriously, I'm very happy to speak today among you and talk about the very critical role that um, we play together with the University of Utah, Salt Lake Community College and University of Utah, have never, in my estimation, been stronger partners. Um, that is a result of relationships, relationships with Dr. Pershing, relationships with Dr. Bradley, Dr. Snyder, um, and now President Watkins, all have been formed and strengthened and nourished because of our deep care for students. And I'm here today to talk about some of those successes and some of the places I think we still have room to grow. So as service providers in Salt Lake County, Salt Lake Community College and University of Utah recognize that our um, mission really starts in middle schools, if not before, with helping young people and their parents understand early on that college is not an option, that some form of college, one year, two year, four years, or beyond, is essential, and that it is there for them, and they have every right to pursue it. So we are striking out with the University of Utah and other partners, and I'm so happy that Rosie's in the room and, and some of the folks that have worked in neighborhood partnerships to say to middle school students and their parents, let us help you identify the path towards college. We know that that's our job, and we take that very seriously. Our college-going culture, as you'll see in a, in a few slides, um, is at risk, I think. I think many of our students and their parents have bought the national um, um, discussion that college is unreachable financially and maybe not valuable. 
And so I'm not going to pursue that. And they make that decision early on. And we need to change that. So where does Salt Lake County go to college? This is squarely on our responsibility. More 82% of the students in Salt Lake County are going to show up at either Salt Lake Community College or University of Utah. And in my preference, they show up at both. And we create a path that allows them to access both of those institutions very, very eagerly and readily and feel welcome when they're there. Our students, they need to stay close to home. Uh, they, most of them have jobs, many of them have families, a lot of them have mortgages, and gone are the days when they're running off to school, living in the dorms, having the four-year collegiate full-time student life that many of us were privileged to have as we went to school. They are fitting college in among many other responsibilities, and it's our job as college educators and administrators and faculty to recognize that and affirm that and then interrogate ourselves and our practices around that so that we know how to adapt to them the best. Although the University of Utah attracts many people, students from out of state and even out of the country, I think uh, President Watkins and her staff and, and Salt Lake Community College folks recognize that we have a significant footprint in the valley and we need, to, we need to pay attention to that. And as my friend Dr. Pam Perluck has, Perluck has already shared with you, this Salt Lake County demographics are rapidly changing. And we as the institutions of higher education need to be very aware of that and we need to understand the asset that that diversity brings to our institutions as learning environments. We, I believe that um, as you look at the ethnic and racial composition that's changing in Salt Lake County and throughout Utah and the nation, that is a message to our faculty and to our policymakers and to our um, system administrators to say, what does that mean for the institution itself? Um, Dr. Perlick uh, sat next, we were sitting next to one another and she sat, she leaned over and she said, Business as usual is broken and unfair. So how do we think about our institutional practices, the way we teach, the way we've created um, admissions and financial aid? How do we interrogate those to be a more opening and inclusive community to these students that are changing before our eyes? And this is the slide that makes me very, very nervous. As Salt Lake County demographics shift, um, we see the white population shifting away from Salt Lake County, and we see an ethnic uh, minority population rising, and we see college participation rates going down. And that is a problem for our county. We have to reverse that trend. And I love what Pam said when she said, these are fixable problems, right? These are things we can get our hands on. These are conversations we can have in terms of access, financial access, location access, climate access, to really think about the institutions that we create and how do we help students see themselves not only as having to go to college, but wanting to go to college and feeling welcome when they come and persisting and completing. So I think we have some work to do as partners in Salt Lake County, and I want to make sure that as we look at all of those um, statistics and demographics, that we recognize um, the Jesuses among us, as Courtney brought out, the individual stories of the lives that could be changed if we can change that paradigm and that thinking and help them see themselves as college students. As president of Salt Lake Community College, I have the great privilege of, I could tell you for hours, individual stories of students who never thought they should go to college, who someone nudged them to go, and who are unbelievably successful now because of the confidence they gained at a community college and then the phenomenal uh, degree they earned as they transferred to the University of Utah and what they're doing out in the world now. But we have to make sure that that pathway is wide and open and free of barriers. When students come to Salt Lake Community College, we have about 56% of our students are first generation. Um, a little over 35% of our students uh, identify as ethnic minority. And when they walk in our doors, they say, the majority of them say, I want to transfer. 
My primary objective in being here is to do the first two years with you and then transfer. And the majority of them are gonna end up at the University of Utah. We have, obviously, as a community college mission, we have a strong workforce education mission. Um, and that's a very vital mission for us. But many of our students have a bachelor's degree in their sites, and we need to nurture that. Um, most of them say they want to pursue a degree or certificate with, with us and then move on. And I want to think, um, just kind of challenge our thinking around the certificates and some of the credentials and that new currency that is emerging in terms of the new ways of learning. One of the things as we look at transfer pathways is what are we going to do as we have students that earn credit from prior learning experience and are credentialed that way? What are we going to do with technical certificates as they transfer? How is the university going to accept that credential and help it be, have a meaningful place in that student's pathway so the student understands that that was great skills that they learned, that it's going to help them build on another degree, and it wasn't wasted time, as sometimes people believe short-term certificates are, you know, they're too utilitarian. But for many of our students, that's the way in the door. That's how they're going to start, and they need to feel empowered to have those, and they need to feel like those have merit and currency as they move through, through, through their degree program. As they say they want to transfer, look where they want to go. They all want to come to the U. And I love that as a University of Utah Go Utes. You know, I, I, I'm very um, supportive of my presidential colleagues at our other sister institutions. But just in proximity, let alone emotional connection, the University of Utah has a place in my heart. And so that is where we are really focusing our efforts. We want our students to be able to transfer seamlessly everywhere. And we will continue to work on that. But as I've said, and as President Watkins and I've talked, and President Pershing before her, we know that the majority of our students are going to show up here. And so how do we start working with them in eighth grade to get to us, and in their freshman year to, with us to get to you and finish? And what do we need to do differently to make that path more seamless? These are the most common AS to BS pathways that they say they want to, that they earn and then finish up in. Um, look at Taylor School right at the top, business. Most of our students want to, they finish with us in business and want to come to Lassonde and to take advantage of all those phenomenal things. And I will tell you, Troy, as a mother, my son had funding from Get Seated his freshman year in Lassonde, and he loved that program. So thank you very much. But this is the way they transfer. They transfer in business, in health sciences, social sciences, psychology. And I think it's incumbent on us to ask ourselves, how are we creating seamless pathways in those particular degrees so that we know that they won't lose credit, they won't lose time, and probably most importantly for our students, they won't lose money. It's a very, it's a tight investment, and it makes sense for them. We have a goal, well, let, let me back up. This, these are program articulations that um, just recently, and I know this is really local, but I think this is important for you all to know. Over the last two or three years, Marty Bradley and Ruth before her and President Pershing, those folks and their faculty have stepped up to really look at certain programs that were not articulating well for a variety of reasons and for which students were actually kind of taking extra courses that they didn't need to. And they've done some work and we've done some work at Salt Lake Community College to align those much more carefully. That's hard work with faculty in disciplines that believe fiercely in their courses. Um, but if we have student success in mind and efficiency in mind and strong learning in mind, we have to come together and put the student first. And we're working on that, but I would argue we have work to do. This is the transfer degree conversion rate right now. That is a, that is a rate that describes of the students that leave us, those that have an Associate of Science, Associate of Arts, or an APE, pre-engineering, how many of those graduate within three years of coming to the University of Utah? And right now, that's only 42%. That's kind of average nationally. I don't like to be average. I think we're doing a disservice to those students. We have a goal in our strategic plan to change that to 60% within the next five years. But the trick for me as a president is I have no control over that number. The University of Utah controls that number. We send them off with their AS degree and we say, 
please, Marty, <laughs> get them to finish. We want them to succeed. And so we've got work to do. And, we, and I want to say in a hopeful tone that the University of Utah has stepped forward to really, really interrogate some of those things and ask themselves, how, they, how can they make that more seamless? And that's going to continue to have to morph based on the certificates and the credentials and the PLA and competency-based education that is changing in front of us and that universities haven't really had to deal with. And I, I'm here to say you need to deal with it because our students are bringing it to you and they should get credit for it. So I'm gonna end on a very hopeful note. One of the most innovative things I think we've done uh, in the last decade in higher education is uh, about three or four years ago, President Pershing and I started talking about, let's get a new building in the fastest growing quadrant of Salt Lake County and let's put higher education access right there. Harriman, if you know Harriman, it's growing double the count at any other southwest quad, any other quadrant in Salt Lake County. It's going crazy with development. It has a high birth rate. It's going to change your numbers, I think, single-handedly. Um, <laughs> lots of educated parents who want their students to succeed and have access, both physical and financial access, to higher education. So our number one priority this year is a building that we are going into together with the University of Utah to eventually get legislative funding and build on the Harriman campus with programs there that are totally designed around high impact, high demand jobs and to feed and, and help support all of the tech growth that is happening in the Southwest section of our, of our county. So we've been very intentional about those programs. And when that gets up and running and when students can access it and when they pay two years of our tuition and then two years of the university's tuition, uh, Ruth doesn't like this slide, but she accepts it. But she accepts it. Uh, they save money. And you know what? Bless her heart for being cooperative and not competitive because students matter, right? We're putting students first and we're putting their pocket, pockets book first. So I hope to make that building a reality and I cannot tell you how proud I am and how grateful I am to have a partner like President Ruth Watkins and I give you my sincerest congratulations to my colleague, but more importantly, my friend. Well, we've come to the end of the first session, and I must say, um, I don't know about you, President Watkins, but I got my 12 ideas already, and we're only a third of the way year there. Uh, and President Sullivan, I think I got my 12 ideas from you alone. And for those of you that can remember data entry, I have one word for you, if you've been around the University of Utah, UNIVAC 1108. <laughs> oh my. We do have a lot of work ahead of us. I want to compliment uh, uh, the university administration here. You have the highest retention and graduation rates in the state. But as a state, we have a big problem. And we have a lot of work to do. And I think uh, this will help us crystallize our thinking of, about it. And to you, President Heftelin, President Watkins, these two to four year programs are absolutely the best. Congratulations. Really great work, I think. Okay, I did my duty in one minute and 30 seconds. It's now time for a break. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>